Um, Dr. Anjay Ristogi is a professor and clinical chief of nephrology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. He's board certified in nephrology and has a doctoral degree in pharmacology. He did his internal medicine residency and nephrology fellowship at UCLA, and he completed his, undergrad his graduate training under the membership of Nobel, Nobel laureate professor uh, Louis Ignaro, also at UCLA. He's very involved in research and is the Director of Nephrology Clinical Research Program, and Medical Director of the End Stage Renal Disease Dialysis Program, and the Living Kidney Donor Program. He funded, he for, founded the Core Kidney Program and Bruins Beans Health Club at UCLA. And we're very excited to have him here talking to us. Um, he is an, ex, an expertise in the kidney and Fabry disease. So take away Dr. Ristogi. Uh, thank you so much, Don, um, and, and thank you, Jerry, for having me um, at this very important event. Uh, like Don said, my name is Anjay Rastogi. I'm a nephrologist, also a pharmacologist, um, and I run the Fabry program at, at uh, UCLA. And, and, and the question that I often get asked is, why is a nephrologist running the uh, Fabry program? And the short answer is because nobody else is, and, uh, and that's where, where things start. But it has been a real privilege taking care of our um, Fabry patients, and I'll be sharing some information, focusing more on kidney disease. And uh, as as Dawn mentioned, the core kidney program. I'll also be going over the green ribbon campaign, and increasing awareness. But let me see. Should I share my screen, Dawn, over here? Yeah, sharing your screen would be great if you want to drive your slides. Yep. Here we go. All right. So kidney and you, and, 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 and you is a pun on, on UCLA actually, because you know, we say UCLA is you. So, uh, so that's, that's um, where I practice. Um, and this is my, my opening slide. But before I, I, I get into the slide deck, uh, the, oops, let me just see, advancing the slides, yes. And this is some of our contact information. Um, Core Kidney at MedNet, um, and then uh, our website as well. So if there's any um, help or information I can give, please feel free to reach out. Um, Dr. Mistogi, down yes. at the bottom, can you click the, the slideshow link? It'll show up bigger. Right now we're seeing your note screen and your actual slide. Okay, slideshow, where is that now? Yeah, click where your cursor is, click that. See if it'll go to a larger screen. Um, let's see. Yeah, click that one again, see what happens. How about now? No, okay, maybe the double dots beside it. Let's see if that increases its size. Click that and see if it says, no. Screen. Hmm. Oh, it's fine. It's just, we get one that's very, we get a small slide you're on and then we see the slide before it, which is fine. Oh, display settings says Ann Gordon. All right, where are, display, are those at the top? Yes, I see them. At the very top of your slide, it says display settings. Like right above your kidneys. <laughs> Where your uh... oh yes 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 of yeah course. click that and see. All right. How about now? Um, beautiful. Well done. Okay. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> it's Thank a it's a group technical support thing here. My All child right. helps me too sometimes. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, just just before I get in the slide deck, just couple of things in the state we are at or in at this point, the, the pandemic. And, um, and it's, it's obviously have, has devastated uh, a lot of things, but I truly and strongly believe that, that we will get through this and we'll come out stronger. And there's a lot of lessons um, that we have learned and, and we'll keep on learning. And some of them actually relate to kidney disease and, and I'll be sharing that. Um, with, as, as I go along, uh, why being proactive is even more important in this uh, pandemic age. So this is, these are your kidneys. Um, you're born with two kidneys. Um, they are bean shaped. Uh, that's where the term kidney beans actually uh, come in from. They are in your back. They, are, they actually under the ninth, 10th and 11th ribs. And the, the longest dimension, we go by the dimension, the size of the kidneys, and it obviously depends upon the size of the body as well. But the longest dimension is anywhere between nine to 11 centimeters. Um, 
So when you get an ultrasound or CT scans, when the kidneys say that this is a size, they're looking at the longest dimension. But just for people to know now we are going a step forward and we, we don't go just by the longest dimension, we go by the kidney volume. That is a, a 3D uh, you know, perspective. So that's more important called the TKV, total kidney volume. And, and, and the reason why this is uh, kind of important is that when a patient shows up to our clinic, we do look at the size of the kidneys. If the kidneys are smaller, then th that really implies a more chronicity of the disease state rather than there are very, very few um, kidney diseases that, that actually cause the kidney size to get bigger. And one of them is, is obviously polycystic kidney disease in which the kidneys can get massive and still the kidneys are dysfunctional. So size does matter, but, but it's important to look at, at the right size and that is the total kidney volume. Um, the, ki the kidneys are actually in your pelvis when, when you know, and, and they, they climb up. And this is also important to keep in mind is because in most of the patients, the kidneys will be in your back, but times the kidneys get, 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 can get stuck in the pelvis or below where they're supposed to be. And that can cause kinking of the ureters and other problems. Now, the other important point that, that, that I, I want to bring up over here is that, um, you know, the, the, the difference between a, a, a nephrologist and a urologist or a kidney specialist. So the, the kidney specialist normally deals with the kidneys. The urologists actually deal more with the bladder and, and the prostate and, and everything else. And they do deal with the kidneys as well if there's a surgical issue. So the question comes up, when do I see a urologist versus a nephrologist? And the short answer is, that most of the times you should definitely be followed by a nephrologist. But if it's purely a bladder issue um, then, then, or, or a prostate, then the urologist should be fine. But it's very important to make sure that you see the right doctors. And the reason why I bring this up, the, the, common, the most common uh, misunderstanding is when you have kidney stones. Now, when you have a kidney stone, you see a urologist and, and they'll take care of it because that's the acute need. But you have to follow up with a nephrologist because um, they, they are the people who would prevent the, the kidney stones from happening in the future. Now, this is once again, a picture of the kidneys. On the left-hand side, you have a normal looking kidney, reddish brown, healthy, proper size. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have a kidney that it has, has, has chronic disease. So there's, they tend to be smaller, uh, wrinkled, scarred. That, that's how they look like. And that's how we kind of differentiate between between one of the ways we differentiate between, between an acute issue um, and a chronic issue as well. Now, why, why, um, why are we talking about kidneys um, in, in this talk, in Fabrice? And, and the short answer that, that I, I really want to put out there is that in majority of patients uh, with Fabry disease, at some point, uh, they will have some kidney issues. And some of them actually will have, have more advanced kidney disease than others. And, and, and the other key point to keep in mind is, so along with, with, with cardiovascular system and, and the uh, neurological system, kidneys are the third organ system that, that are affected and they affect the morbidity and mortality um, in, a, in a Fabry patient. And, and so our focus is obviously to prevent kidney disease as much as we can. But before we do that, what do the kidneys do? I think that's, that's actually, quite important. It's one of the most complex organs in your body. And I'm not saying that because I'm a nephrologist, but if you to, to speak to all the physicians in their training, they would say the kidneys were one of the most, most uh, complex systems that they studied. So if they are that complex, they, 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 their treatment is also complex. And, and I think that's, that's what we'll be getting into a bit more as, as we move. In, in a very simplistic term, what do the kidneys do? They, they purify your blood. Um, so the they blood goes in the kidneys, they, they, they're like a lab, they keep the good products, they get rid, rid, uh, rid of the waste products, which actually end up in the urine, and that's how. Uh, but it's obviously much more complex than that. But it is a way, and it's one of the vital organs. And, and, and if you look at the heart, the lung, and the kidneys, right? The, 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 a patient whose kidneys have failed will not be able to survive for any significant amount of time. So I think that's obviously if your lungs and the heart fail, the death will occur more rapidly. But with kidneys, if they completely shut down, then, then, then also your, your, your body will not survive. 
So I think that's important also. Uh, Acid-based electrolytes, fluid maintenance, that's one of the major functions of the kidneys. We'll be going over that in, in a bit more detail. And, and these functions, when the kidneys don't work well, um, problems arise. So why am I mentioning all these things? You know, uh, the stage of the kidney disease, which I'll be going over, is also very important. And, and these are the things that we look out for. One is the kidney disease itself. And the second thing is what happens when the kidneys don't work properly. And these are the problems that, that come up. Drug clearance. Now, being a pharmacologist, um, you know, we, we really pay special attention to this. So there are two things to keep in mind. Number one is that, that uh, along with liver, kidneys are, are one of the key organs that, that clear the drug. Drug is, a, is an exogenous substance that we ingest and, and they're either cleared by the liver or the kidneys or both. And, and when the kidneys don't work well, um, obviously the, the, and, and the drug is cleared by the kidneys, that really something that we have to keep in mind and adjust. But the other thing that you really have to keep in mind as well, and this applies to supplements and herbs and all that stuff, that if you are ingesting those 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 over the counter herbal supplements and 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 you know even prescribed drugs, since they are cleared by the kidneys in in a good portion of cases, they also can damage the kidneys, and and and, and the liver. And I think that's also something when, when we look at when somebody's coming with, 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 with in what we call the acute kidney injury, we always look at what else they have they ingested. And when you have, if a drug is causing the kidney problem, then just adjustment of the dose is not enough. The, the uh, over-the-counter medications, some of them very common, non-steroidals, a lot of people still don't understand the significance of these ibuprofens and Motrins. Um, they, they can on long-term, use can significantly cause kidney damage. Proton pump inhibitors like, like omeprazoles and, and, and all those drugs that suppress acid, they on long-term can also cause kidney problems. So these are some of the commonly used over-the-counter drugs that, that, that uh, so drug clearance is, is, and then the hormonal functions are very, very important. There's a hormone called epogen. Um, that are erythropoietin that's synthesized by, by cells in the kidneys. And when the kidney function declines, so why do the kidneys, it's interesting. So the hormone erythropoietin or, or epogen acts on the bone marrow and causes synthesis of red blood cells. So, so why is kidney involved with that? You know, I mean, why are kidney involved in, in anemia and hemoglobin? Well, it's, it's much more complex than that. Once again, going to the complexity of, of, of kidneys. So kidneys are acting as oxygen sensor. That's what keeps you alive, right? Oxygen. So kidneys sense oxygen. And when your oxygen levels, perceived oxygen levels goes down, kidneys respond by creating more erythropoietin and that increases the hemoglobin and iron and all that stuff. So, so kidneys are, are, and that's why once again, when your kidney function declines, um, it's, it's linked with, with, with anemia and also with, with iron deficiency. So um, uh, anemia, a, a big uh, complication with advanced kidney disease, vitamin D uh, activation. So the vitamin that D that we ingest or we get from the sun is not the active form of vitamin D. It has to go through the kidneys and more specifically through the proximal tubule where there's hydroxylated and that activates a vitamin D. So if your kidneys are not working, no matter how much vitamin D you're ingesting, you will still be vitamin D deficient. And in those cases, if it's gone beyond a point, then we have to give active vitamin D back to these patients. And last but not the least is blood pressure maintenance. Kidneys are very vital. Now, once again, going back to, I, 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 I made that kind of a joke that why is a nephrologist running the, the Fabric program? And, and the short answer was because nobody else is. But but what about blood pressure? Who do you see as a specialist? Um, and I think this is also important. Kidneys are very central to blood pressure regulation. High blood pressure is linked to kidney damage and kidney damage leads to high blood pressure. So it's a very vicious cycle. So if, if you have high blood pressure, then you have three, three options. I mean, obviously more than that, but three big options to see as a subspecialist. You can see a cardiologist and most of the patients see a cardiologist for high blood pressure. You can see a kidney specialist or you can see an endocrinologist. Endocrinologists have, have a role in secondary hypertension, not pri primary hypertension. But what about cardiologists versus nephrologists? And I can tell you 
um, that that this is something that blood pressure when 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 a patient has out of control blood pressure they should be seen by a nephrologist that's our specialty and we take ownership in controlling so so if if you have a difficult to control blood pressure uh, you should should seek out a help of a kidney specialist now this is a picture of the nephron and and the reason why i i put this up is for multiple reasons number one you know you hear different terms you see see the term uh, nephrologist, you see, uh, hear the term renal specialist, and you see the term kidney specialist. Well, the term nephrologist comes from the nephron, and the nephron is a structural and functional unit of the kidney, and each kidney is made of a, a million nephrons. So that's where the term nephrologist, but now we are moving away from these terms to make more things more simplistic. So now we are using the word kidney. So whether it be, we used to call end-stage renal disease, now we call it end-stage kidney disease. We used to call it chronic renal failure, now we call it chronic kidney disease. So the term we're trying to use more and more is kidneys rather than, than these other terms. But, but let's talk about this nephron. You see those, those two, um, and I don't know if this, this pointer works over here, but this red um, uh, pipe is, is the artery. It feeds blood into this cup-shaped structure called glomerulus. Now, kidneys are, are the most vascular organ in your body. 25% of what heart pumps goes to the kidneys, 25%. I mean, that's one fourth. And think about that. Kidneys are so small. I showed you the size as compared to the body, 150 grams, but, but, but the, the amount of blood. And the reason for that is the kidneys, it's not just they, they want to provide you know, the, the, the nutrients and oxygen, but kidneys are involved in purification. So what affects the kidneys will, will affect the heart and vice versa. The number one cause of morbidity and mortality in a kidney patient is cardiovascular disease. So when a patient has kidney disease, by definition, they have two more things. One is cardiovascular disease and the other is bone. And these are the, what I call the three angles of, of a triangle. Kidneys obviously being at the top because I'm a nephrologist, but, but all three organs are actually very, very critical. And there is, is cr crosstalk between, between all three and obviously a lot more, but cardiovascular disease. So whenever I, I say about managing kidney disease, I, the, 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 um, the strong message is aggressive management of cardiovascular disease as well, including diabetes, if you have diabetes as well, but high cholesterol, high blood pressure. And, 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 and to our kidney donors, what I tell them is, is what's good for your heart is also good for your kidneys. So, so and we'll be going over uh, diet in, uh, in a bit more detail. Now, this is your glomerulus, the cup-shaped structure. It filters, it acts like a sieve. And the purpose of this filter is to get rid of the waste products, and, and retain the good ones. And the good ones include protein. And this, this ultra filtrate uh, then goes to the different segments of the nephron and then eventually comes out as urine at the end. Now, a couple of things over here, and which is quite important, is that, that number one, it's, it's the, the glomerulus acts as a filter. And, and that's where the term GFR comes from glomerular filtration rate. So one take home message for everybody in the audience is if they already don't do that, check your GFR every time you go in to see your, your physician or, or healthcare provider and track it down. Trends are actually very important. So GFR and the GFR actually comes from creatinine. It can come from cystatin C, but, but basically what GFR is doing is looking at the filtration rate of your glomerulus. And that is the single most important test of your kidneys. Now, the other thing I mentioned is that the, 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 the glomerulus act as a filter, as acts as sieve, and its purpose is to retain all the good products um, and, and get rid of waste product. And it does a pretty good job, but it's not perfect. And there's still some amount of protein that we don't want to be losing in, in, in the urine uh, spills out. A small amount of protein is okay, but if it becomes massive, then that's a problem. And we call it proteinuria. So protein is, along with GFR, protein in the urine is something that we follow very, very closely. Now, let me talk more about protein because that is important. And we'll talk about diet, you know, protein as well, but that's a bit of a separate thing. Here is protein in the urine is, is acting as, as a marker of kidney disease. So when a patient comes in, for example, lupus nephritis, um, they, the lupus, what, what affects the kidneys, we actually monitor that, that. And it, so when we put them on treatment, we'll follow 
how the protein levels are coming down. And, and if they're not coming down, it's an indication that the treatment is not working. So when you go to your physician, the other thing that you should really monitor is your protein levels in the urine. And, and talk to your physician, asking questions, be proactive, ask them questions. Why am I still spilling this amount of protein? What else can I do? Why is my GFR going down? Catching it early is very, very critical. There's a special kind of protein called albumin. It's, it's a much more sensitive indicator of kidney damage. So a lot of times your healthcare provider, instead of checking protein in your urine, is probably gonna check albumin in your urine. And that's completely fine. So albumin or protein is it's a very sensitive indicator of, of, of uh, uh, kidney damage. The other important thing is that, that um, protein in the ultrafiltrate can cause further damage. So it again sets up a vicious cycle that it can cause more damage to the, to, to the existing tubule and nephron that's, that's, that's present there. So we spoke about the major functions, the acid base, water, electrolytes, and, and all, all the other good stuff that the kidneys do. So now, how do you know you have a kidney problem? And, and, and I think this is where some of the issues in this pandemic time are really coming up. You can present with some swelling. Your legs are swollen. Right, your face is swollen. Your eye, you know, around your eyes, you you you're swollen. So, so, so that that could be, and this is once again because of retention of of salt and water. Some patients can complain of back pain. You know, your kidneys are in the back. So most of the times, like I said, they they ascend and they might get caught somewhere else. But but in in majority of cases, it's in the back. So you're complaining of back pain. But but kidneys in general don't cause pain. You know, I think that's important. The, if you have back pain, there's a pretty good chance it might be coming from other uh, organ systems, including the musculoskeletal system. But kidneys can cause pain and kidney stones are a class example. You might be peeing blood, you know, what we call gross hematuria as opposed to micro hematuria. So the difference is that, that a lot of times you have blood in the urine, but unless you test for it, you won't see it. But some patients can be peeing pure blood. And, 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 and there's a, it's, you know, a very small amount of blood in the urine can make it look red. So you, I'm, I'm peeing blood. I mean, that's, that's what, so th th that can happen as well. Your, your urine output might decrease. Now this is important. So, so a lot of people think that, well, you know, I'm peeing just fine, doctor. I mean, why are you saying my kidneys are, are, are not working well? So here's another key message from today's presentation. It's not just the quantity of urine but it's also the quality of urine that's important. A lot of my dialysis patients, they're on dialysis already. They make a liter, two liters, or even more uh, urine. So, but, but the quality is really bad. So the quantity and quality both going, just, so just because you're making good amount of urine does not mean that your kidneys are working appropriately. Actually, in some conditions, the fact that you have kidney disease can lead to increased urine output. Now, if you have decreased urine output or making no urine, then obviously that's a problem. I mean, that's then I, I don't think you, there's, there's any doubt, but the problem could be anywhere from the kidneys down to the bladder, the prostate and the urethra and below, right? So then you have to find out where is the problem. But decreased urine output um, obviously can, can signal kidney damage, but, but not necessarily. And I think that's an important point to frothiness of urine. And frothiness of urine, um, is kind of an indication of protein in the urine. And as I already mentioned that protein is not a good thing, right, in, in the urine. But, but there are a lot of other things that can cause foaminess and frothiness of urine. But if you've seen a change in your urine, then, then probably you need to start thinking about kidney damage. But the key thing is, and this is the message that I want everybody to take home, is in the majority of cases, kidney disease is silent. It does not cause any symptoms. And, and, and the only way you can test for kidney disease is by a blood test and a urine test. Now, why is that relevant now? And, and this is something that we have seen. My chairman of medicine, who is probably one of the brightest men I've ever met, and he said at the start of the pandemic, he says, Anjay, the patients are not going to die from, from COVID. They are going to die from the fact that they are not getting healthcare and they're not going to see their physicians. And we are seeing that now, that, that these are the patients that, that now are coming a, a year later saying, I don't feel well. And you see their labs and it's, it's, it's out of whack. Um, so, so why? Because they were asymptomatic. 
till the end. And now, you know, these symptoms are building up. There is a whole metabolic process going on in their body. So, so it's very important that that we and, and, and the scheduled assessments that we do for our, our kidney patients are, are quite important. But it's very important to impress upon your patients that they need to be followed on a regular basis. The, the kidney disease will be asymptomatic in which, and the earlier you intervene, the better results you'll get, you know, to, to either pull back, stop the progression, or slow down the progression. So a message that needs to be given to all our patients and everybody else for that matter, is that kidney disease tends to be asymptomatic. And, 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 and unless you test for it, you can completely, there are patients who come in and they need dialysis and they say, doc, I'm feeling just fine. Well, they're feeling fine till the end. You know, the disease is not asymptomatic completely. It's just asymptomatic at presentation, but when it manifests itself, it is. And that's where the education is very critical for, for, for these patients. And, and uh, I can't emphasize enough that, that how patients actually um, come so late to us that we can do very little uh, except for provide them, you know, um, you know, replacement therapy or transplant. Um, so how do you assess for kidney function? Simple test, you know, creatinine, we spoke about GFR, checking the urine, and then imaging studies and biopsies. So imaging studies, which, which is ultrasound, CT scans, MRIs, um, you know, we do them routinely, at least at the, at the baseline assessment. And then if we can't um, still find the diagnosis, we do a kidney biopsy. But the key thing over here is that a simple blood test and a simple urine test should give us most of the answers. And these are widely available, inexpensive tests should be done on a routine basis. Now, uh, types of kidney injury, uh, two big groups are acute and chronic. And today we'll be fo focusing more on chronic, but there is, and there's a third uh, category as well called acute on chronic kidney disease. You know, you have chronic kidney disease and you have an acute injury. So acute injury basically means that there is an acute insult. And, and, and the good thing about the acute insult is that, that if you remove that insult, the inciting agent, whether it be drugs or whether it be, a, you know, an immune attack, whatever it is, um, you can pull back, right? And, you know, and a lot of these patients will come back to baseline. And, but also keep in mind acute injury can, can leave memory in the kidney. And then, you know, there's, there's research, more and more data coming out that even though a kidney function returns to normal after removing the insult, they're still prone to progressing down the line. But acute is acute. We won't be focusing too much on that, but chronic kidney disease is what, what, what we'll be focusing on, that the patient lives with kidney disease. Now, this is the definition from, from NKF, National Kidney Foundation, published in AGKD in, in 2002. Um, this is a slide that I've used a fair bit, and, I, and, for, and the reason why I use this is for simplicity. And so how do, do we define chronic kidney disease? So it's, it's defined based on chronicity, and chronicity is three months. So if a patient has any evidence of kidney damage for three months or more, then they qualify and classify as having chronic kidney disease. Now, the important point here that I really want to point out is what qualifies as kidney damage? So one is very obvious. If your filtration rate, GFR, is low, your normal GFR, you know, depends upon age, is above 90. But GFR, if it's below 60, then by itself, it can, it can qualify them as having chronic kidney disease. But the important point here over here is a good portion of patients can have a completely normal GFR, but have other evidence of kidney damage. What, for example, protein. They're spilling a lot of protein in their urine. You know, uh, they're asymptomatic, the GFR is normal. So if you don't check their urine, you will never find out. So for completeness sake, you have to do both the, the blood test and the urine test and checking for protein. They might have enlarged kidneys for whatever reason, positive kidney disease, once again, they are. So, so you know, to, to really, um, you know, uh, quantify and classify kidney damage, you have to do at the minimum blood and urine test and at least at baseline um, 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 an imaging test. So we do that routinely. You know, biopsy is only in special circumstances when after all the blood tests, urine tests, imaging studies, we still don't have the answer, then we go for, for a kidney biopsy. So I, I hope this point is clear. Now, this is also quite important, the five stages of chronic kidney disease. So at the left hand is stage one, which is the earliest, and stage five is the most advanced, which we call kidney failure, which we call end-stage renal disease, end-stage kidney disease, and, and, and what, you know, what forth. Now, for a patient, you know, 
you have done all the right things. You have looked at your GFR, you have looked at the protein. The third thing that I would ask you to do is based on your GFR, find out what stage you're in. Now, you know, you can, and you can read this slide. I, I don't have to, you know, uh, repeat it, but as your GFR is dropping, you're progressing from stage one, two, three, four, and five. Now, this is not just something that we came up with that, that we are, there are significance of, of these classes. And, and stages. And the significance is that as your kidney disease advances, the, 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 what we, the, uh, the uh, metabolic abnormalities, the electrolyte abnormalities changes as well. For example, if you're in stage one, you probably are not gonna have hyperkalemia or high potassium, right? As opposed to stage five, when you're gonna have high. So a lot of people, you know, the misconception is, well, if you have kidney disease, you should be in, on a low potassium diet. No, that's not the, it, it depends upon your stage. It's, a lot of patients with kidney disease might have low potassium and low potassium can be as bad as high potassium. So it's very important that, that once you, you have checked your GFR, you've checked your protein, find out what stage of kidney disease you fall in and, and there'll be different, um, you know, ramifications of that. One is about your diet. The other thing is, is what, what we look for. But the other important thing is, when, when I see the stage, what is my plan? So if I see a stage one or even stage two, my plan is to pull them back. And this is only you can do when you early diagnosis and treatment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you show up in stage five, there's probably very little I can do to, to, to save the kidneys but I can help you with transplant and dials and all that stuff, but I can't help you with your, your native kidneys, your existing kidneys. But in stage one and two, that's my focus. You know, a lot of patients come to me and say, doctor, the first question that I get asked is, and you ask a nephrologist, how far am I from dialysis? You know, and, and they start talking about transplant, you know, and if somebody talks to me about transplant stage three and, and even early stage four, I said, I don't want to talk to you about transplant. I don't want to talk to you about dialysis. That, I'll talk to you, you know, I run the dialysis program at UCLA. I run the living donor program. I mean, that's my focus, but my job is to prevent you from getting on dialysis or transplant. That's what, what a nephrologist needs to focus on. And that's what the patient should focus on because it should not be, uh, you know, kind of a safety net that, hey, guess what? I'll get on transplant dialysis and, and everything will be okay. Well, it won't be okay. You know, it'll be better but than, than failing kidneys, but your native kidneys are your native kidneys and everything should be done. So the stage is also very important how aggressive I'm gonna be. You know, if you're showing in late stage four and five, I won't be that aggressive because it's always a balance between risk versus benefits. And a lot of the treatments that we put you on, you might have adverse events. So I would probably be more in the sense that let me slow down this a bit and, and, and get them prepped. So the short end of it is that please do look at your stage as well. Look at your GFR, look at the protein in the urine, and look at what stage your kidney disease are in. And sometimes you can move back and forth because creatine, you know, keep in mind, you know, there could be lab errors, there could be lab fluctuations, you know. So so the trend is more important. Now, obviously, if, if, if your creatine goes from 0.6 to 5, you know, I mean, that's not a trend. I mean, that, that's an acute, but it goes from 0.7 to 0.9, then comes back. And, and, you know, so there could be a fluctuation. So trends are very important when you're looking at, at kidney disease, especially chronicity. Causes, diabetes and hypertension are by far the most common cause, ADPKD, glomerulonephritis, and then others. What are some of the other causes? And I think, you know, Fabry disease is kind of unique uh, in, 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 in when you look at it. And why is it unique? So I mentioned Fabry disease, you know, and, and, and this is quite important because, so when you look at, at, at Fabry's and, and, and there were these protocol biopsies done, and I think it was a Norwegian study in which a patient, the, the kids had no uh, signs or symptoms of, ki of kidney disease. And they did the biopsies and it showed significant involvement of kidneys, even in preteen kids. So Fabry disease affects kidneys early on. And I think this is really important to keep in mind. And, and um, they, if, you know, in a, in a good number of patients, they will end up on dialysis or stage five, needing dialysis or transplant in their late thirties, early forties. That's much younger than our, our, our patients with, 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 you know, a general day, which is late fifties, early sixties. And also, uh, you know, kidney disease patients are an enriched population for Fabry disease. 
you know, anywhere between 0.5 to 1% patients on dialysis, depending on what studies you look at, might have Fabry's disease undiagnosed. Also, the important thing is your family members at risk. So if you or your loved one has Fabry disease and might be advanced, but what about the family members who are at risk? Make sure that they get tested as well, not just for Fabry disease, but for kidney involvement as well. So, so Fabry disease is in this subset of population is a very important cause of kidney disease. And I think that's something that I cannot stress on uh, enough. So every Fabry patient should be considered very high risk of kidney disease, very high risk if they don't already have kidney disease uh, based on whatever tool you're looking at, um, including kidney biopsy. So I think that's, that's important. Um, what, can, what can damage your kidneys? Well, high blood pressure, diabetes, drugs, prescribed drugs can, can, can damage it. Over-the-counter medication, we spoke about some of them, ibuprofens and Motrin, all the non-steroidals, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, you know, we just take them and we don't understand how bad they can be. Recreational medications, cocaines and all these stuff, bad for your kidneys. Um, well, they're bad for a lot of things, but, 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 but they're kidney killers in, in my opinion. Uh, herbal medications, you know, we take herbal medications that say, well, not so much, be very careful. And a lot of people come to me and say, well, can I take this herbal medication? Can I say that herbal medications? And, and my short answer to that is, I don't know. And, and when I say, I don't know, I'm talking from a science perspective, uh, nobody who's in science will actually know because we don't know, number one, what's inside. We don't know how much is inside, right? So, so how can we give an advice on that? Um, now, I just want to give a source. Um, UCLA puts these UCLA MD chats. Um, so these are programs um, in which it's for patient oriented um, and different specialists come on. They go to the small studio. They used to, right now it's on hold because of <coughs> excuse me, COVID-19. But they, they record these uh, half an hour webinars. Some of them are shorter. Minds are for half an hour, and they go over what a patient should know. And and what I would would recommend for for and and by the way, these webinars are not Rastogi's opinion. It's not like you know I. This is what what um, people, you know, specialists across the globe think is the best practice. So um, and and then they post them on YouTube. That's a that's a beautiful part of that. So they record these things. Well, they, they put them live and then record them and they post them. So there's one on high blood pressure, one is on kidney disease, one is on dr drugs and medications, and one is on Fabry disease. So there are four um, programs. So if you just Google or put in uh, YouTube, you can find those or, or email me and I'll send you the link. But drugs are very important. Being a pharmacologist, I cannot overemphasize how important drugs and <coughs> excessive excuse me, protein supplementation very, very important. And, and, and taking too much protein is really bad for your kidneys. And, and please make sure that, and then infections, HIV, Hep C, immune dysregulations, all those. We spoke about these medications. <clears throat> also, if you do any imaging study, contrast, um, excuse me, let's take my water, um, contrast, um, uh, CT scans, intravenous contrast, um, MRIs and all that stuff, make sure that you talk to your nephrologist. And the uh, things have to be dosed properly. Um, all right. All right. This is cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> so in this slide, um, on the y-axis, the vertical axis, you have annual mortality, cardiovascular. On the x-axis, you have age. This is, you know, this is not the Fabry population. This is everybody. The point that we make from this slide, and this is obviously an older slide published in AJKD in 2000. And what, what we mentioned from this slide is, if you look at the top line, the red one, that's a dialysis population. The yellow one is a general population. A 25-year-old patient on dialysis has the same risk of, of dying from cardiovascular disease, heart problems, as an 85-year-old who is not on dialysis. So these patients might look normal from outside, but internally, the internal aging is far more advanced than the external aging. And I think sometimes it fools us. It just like, you know, we've seen this colon cancer that, you know, we, we normally do at 50 years old and 
but now the patients who can be diagnosed in the thirties and you know, it's all, but, but don't let your age or how you look fool you that how advanced internally, especially your cardiovascular system might be, whether it be calcification and all that stuff. So I think that's an important point. The number one cause of death in a kidney patient is cardiovascular disease, it's heart problems. So if you have kidney disease, you have heart disease, treat that aggressively. You know, I actually send some of my patients to a cardiologist, you know, preemptive, you know, preventative. You know, some of my cardiologists would say, why are you sending this patient? They look fine. I said, well, exactly. That's the reason I'm saying, because I want them to continue to look fine. Uh, and then I will go over preventative cardiology. You know, I, I give them a lot of advice about cardiovascular disease, but, but you know, if I can get them hooked up with, with, with a cardiologist, why not? They obviously will know a lot more than I do. That's what they, they practice day in, day out. They can look at things that I'm not looking at. And obviously with, with a Fabry patient, there are other things with cardiovascular disease that they should be looking at. But if you have purely even kidney disease, irrespective of Fabry's, you should be seen by, by a cardiologist at, at least. On, these are some of the risk factors, the traditional risk factors, the non-traditional, non-classical risk factors. You have that list. I'm not going to go over one by one. Complications associated with chronic kidney disease. Anemia and iron deficiency. We spoke about that. When you have kidney disease, you have EPO deficiency. But it's much more complex than that. The Nobel Prize last year was given out uh, for, for what we call the, the HIF, hypoxia, hypoxia inducible factors. Um, and, and now we have drugs coming out, you know, uh, hopefully pretty soon that, that will utilize that, that hypoxia in these with factor and stabilization. And we were heavily involved in those studies as well. Uh, ASN, the American Society of Nephrology that's happening later this month in, in Denver. Um, uh, there'll be a lot of very, very interesting information being presented on anemia and RN deficiency but, and HIF, HIF stabilizers. But once again, the Nobel Prize was given it last year um, for work on the HIFs. So once again, kidneys central role in the body beyond just making urine. Um, RN deficiency, very, very important. There's a, there's a factor called hepcidin, there's inflammation. So when you have advanced kidney disease, um, your iron absorption is impaired. First of all, iron absorption is not that great to start with. Um, and, uh, but then if you have a kidney disease, it's even more impaired. And a lot of these patients will need intravenous iron to be given because they don't absorb iron properly. So anemia and iron deficiency, very, very important. I spoke about bone and mineral disease uh, at length. Um, now, the, the, this is the other place where the nephrologist will need to take ownership. It's not the endocrinologist. They can work with the endocrinologist, but, 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 the, but the nephrologist has a central role. We deal with bone and mineral disease on a daily basis. So, and bone disease in a kidney patient is quite complex. So please, and there's even in Fabry patient, there were some concerns about osteoporosis. We actually had um, an abstract in a poster presentation a couple of years ago. But anyway, the short end of it is that, that you, with kidney disease, you have bone disease, you add fabric disease on top of that, uh, it, leads, it leads to another layer of complexity um, uh, in, in bones. Malnutrition can happen with, with, with kidney disease, very important. Acidosis and electrolyte problems. Now let me talk about acidosis a bit. You know, the, 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 the body works at, at, at a certain pH. Um, we call it 7.4, which is in your blood. It can be 7.35. It can be. It's, it's a bit of range, but it's a very narrow range, 7.4 and plus minus 0.05. Right? Your cells pH is 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 a bit lower, and you probably know the lysosomes. It's even lower. But 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 anyways, there, there is a very specific pH that your body needs to 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 work at. Otherwise, your body will go completely out of whack. And which is one of the key organs that maintains that pH? Your kidneys, your favorite organ, right? Um, and, and lungs all obviously have, have a role as well, but kidneys really fine tune your pH. Now, you know, there's acid versus base and, and the kidneys function is to regulate that. But in general, you have a lot more acid load than a base load. And that's coming from your diet, especially if you eat what we call a typical Western diet that is high in protein, that leads to a significant acid load that, that we take with. So once again, the advantage of a plant-based diet, you know, um, so, so plant-based diet has shown over and over again to be more kidney friendly. 
So, so one of the things that I always tell my patients is if you can switch to a plant-based diet, you, your kidneys will be happier. Um, now, acid builds up and, and we try to modify diet. If that doesn't work, then you will get, need to give base back. And the base is bicarbonate, which is as simple as baking soda that you might take. But first, modify your diet. Acid is very, very important. And acid, once again, is asymptomatic, but can cause chronic damage. Uh, electrolyte problems, sodium, potassium, phosphorus. And we spoke about cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure and hypertension. High blood pressure leads to kidney problems. Kidney problems leads to hypertension and, and, and uh, obviously the fluid management is, is quite critical. So if you go to those YouTube videos that I mentioned, these things are discussed in a lot more detail, uh, you know, from a patient's perspective. High blood pressure, um, find out what your goal is. Just like if you're diabetic, what's your A1C goal? If you have high cholesterol, what's your cholesterol LDL goal? Ask your doctor, what is my blood pressure goal? Should it be 110 over 70? Should it be 120 over 80? Whatever the goal is, because identify that goal. Home blood pressure readings are by far the best. These are the classes of drugs that we prefer as ACE inhibitors or ARBs because they, they're not just good for the kidneys, they're also good for your heart and they also lower protein. Remember protein that I mentioned in the urine? Well, this is the class of drugs that we put them on to, to lower the amount of protein. Salt intake, very important. And to be more uh, clear, it's a sodium chloride that we're talking about. Now, I talk to my patients and say that how much, none of my patients has ever volunteered they're in a high salt diet. Nobody has ever told me that. I'm still looking for my first patient who will say, hey doc, I'm on a high salt diet. Everybody is on a low salt diet till you check their urine, you know, and then you find out how much salt. But, but they're not completely, you know, incorrect about that. They equate salt intake with, with the, with the uh, 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 table salt, the salt shaker. But that is not the salt that I'm talking about. Most of the salt is a hidden salt. What is a hidden salt? It's a salt that you don't think about. You eat bread, you eat outside, you eat things with, with preservatives. All of that is full of salt. So monitor your salt intake. It's very, very important. Well, they, they're put on diuretics, Lasix, furosemide, hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothiazide. What do these drugs do? They just get rid of excess salt, but they come with a baggage and, and they can cause. So as a pharmacologist, I always say, you know, drugs should not replace lifestyle modifications. You know, you should not be adding a drug when you can modify that by, by, by changing your diet or lifestyle. And same thing applies over here. I'm not gonna add a diuretic just because they're in a high salt diet. Few times I have to do that, but I tell them first, let's control your salt with your, some of the medications have salt in them, sodium. So, so you know, it's challenging, you know, it's, it, that's why we call it hidden salt. It's not the obvious salt. So, so but anyways, there, there, there are some steps you can take to, to decrease that. We spoke about eye anemia, check your hemoglobin, check your iron levels, um, and then talk to your physician uh, how to manage your anemia and iron. This is a very uh, influx field. Your guidelines keep on changing. So speak to your nephrologist, speak to your... The other thing that I don't have a slide over here is early referral to a nephrologist. And that has shown... Oh, now, once again, we... You know, nephrologists in general are not looking for business. They are overworked, they have, they're too busy. And, and the biggest problem is getting them into a nephrology clinic or kidney clinic. But I strongly recommend everybody to, to be seen by a nephrologist, a kidney specialist early on. You know, ask your primary care physician to send a referral. I don't mind sending my patients to a cardiologist even though there's no overt sign of heart disease. I mean, I refer them right away. I said, see, and, and, and these, and, and, what it, and the purpose is preventative cardiology. They see them once a year, go in and, and they just put their two cents in. It, it could be a quick visit. They might find out something that we're not seeing, right? I'm not a cardiologist. You know, I'm not up with the latest that they might be on. So it, if, if possible, see the subspecialist, especially for Fabry's disease. Bone disease, vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, PTH. These are the tests that we look for, check them talk to your nephrologist. We spoke about acid load already. Kidney patients tend to accumulate acid load in, in their blood. This is a bit different from your stomach acidity. Um, so so uh, this is your blood acidity, you know, which, which is reflective. And, and what we check for, if you look at your labs, so what we haven't done, and we were 
going to do was going to do uh, one of our webinars on on labs, and uh, I think that's going to be coming up soon. Um, but but the pandemic hit and everything got delayed. But learn how to check your labs, and and one of the things that we look for is a blood bicarbonate level. So check for for TCO2, uh, to, which is total carbon dioxide in your blood, which is another um, you know more sophisticated way of saying blood blood uh, bicarbonate. And your TCO2 should be more than 22 depending upon your lab too. Some labs have 21, some might have 23, but our lab has 22. So, so make sure that it is above 22. Electrolytes, potassium, sodium, calcium, phosphorus. Um, all this depends upon your CKD stage as well. Which stage are you, are you in stage one? Are you in stage three? Are you in stage five? Fluid um, management very important uh, as as well um, and uh, but what you know one of the things that drinking plenty of fluid what is plenty of fluid um, I think um, that's a question that your physician should answer but if everything is quote unquote within range then I would say anywhere between a liter and a half to two liters uh, of water that sounds like a lot but but uh, I you know you stay on the hydrated side um, and anything that will tend to make you dehydrated, um, you know, it's hotter, uh, you're out a lot, you're taking a long flight, you know, all those things are potentially dehydrating. So, or, you know, obviously you, you have diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, um, all those things. So, so be one step ahead of hydration. Um, so, because kidneys don't like 25% of the cardiac output goes to the kidneys. There's, if there's one thing that kidneys don't like is dehydration. And the term that we use is, is called pre-renal kidney failure. So, so um, and, and why do we say pre-renal? Because the kidneys are fine. Uh, it's just that they're dehydrated. So please, uh, if you can um, make sure that, that hydration, water, 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 make sure that, that you're drinking water. Uh, uh, now, um, I think I'm towards the end of my presentation. So what's the optimal care for a CKD patient? This is an older slide uh, from Brian Pereira, published in Kidney International 2000. But, but the theme is still the same. Let's go one by one. The right at the top is early detection. Keep in mind, kidney disease is silent. You will not be showing up with symptoms of kidney disease. So urine test, blood test on a regular basis is critical. So once you have found out that there's kidney problems, then the first column is delaying progression. And all the good stuff, ACE inhibitors, blood pressure control, blood sugar control, exercising, eating well, protein restriction, those all go into delaying progression of kidney disease. The second column is preventing complications. So anemia, we spoke about malnutrition, uh, bone disease, a more fancy term is osteodystrophy, uh, acidosis, we spoke about the acid, very subtle, but can have long-term you know, consequences. The third column is to treat, treat the comorbid conditions, whether it be cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, whatever it is. And, and these all apply to fabric patients, by the way. Uh, and then finally, prepare for renal replacement therapy. Um, now, I, I haven't gone into specific treatment uh, disease specific. Uh, I think Mr. Walter spoke about that. Depends upon upon your mutations, what you need to be on. Um, do you qualify for a study? You know, talk to your fabric specialist that you're dealing with. Uh, what is the, the best? But uh, being on proper treatment is very, very important. Disease specific treatment is critical. The last column is prepared for RRT. So what is renal replacement therapy? So you, the patient has, has advanced to stage four and five. And now, like I said, the odds of, of, of correcting the kidney disease in your native kidneys is lower and lower. Uh, so what we do now is transitioning them to dialysis and transplant. And that's what we call renal replacement therapy. This is something very, very important. Uh, we do a spare. This is one of the toughest times in a patient's life with kidney disease in when they're transitioning. There's, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of depression. Um, and, and, but it doesn't have to be that tough. Um, and, 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 you know, with a proper support group and the advocacy group, the, the transition can be very smooth. 
Now, a couple of things to keep in mind when you when you are thinking about replacement therapy. Home dialysis, especially PD, is, is a way to go, at least for our patients with Fabry disease. Because when you think about Fabry disease, think about diabetic patients. You know, it's very similar, the vascular disease, uh, you know, phenomena and stuff. So PD patients is, is a good, so home dialysis is what you should shoot for. The other important thing is uh, transplantation. Transplantation by far is the best option for patients with advanced kidney disease. Now, uh, there's a delay in, in, in transplantation because of the deceased donors. The list is too long, the waiting time. And, and it's, it's very rarely if, if you can get a transplant before you get on dialysis. So you have to go on the waiting list, but make sure that, that you, 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 you find out where the waiting list is shortest and stuff. But, but the other way is to look for a living kidney donor. And, um, you know, the, and that's what can lead to what we call preemptive transplant. What is a preemptive transplant? Is that you get on transplant before you even get on dialysis. And most of the time, it's, it's through a living donor. Um, when do you start thinking of, of dialysis and transplant? Well, people have different. And, you know, when your GFR falls below 30, then you should definitely be on, the, on, on your radar. But especially when it falls below 20, then you can get listed at a transplant center, making sure that you have the right access. If you do have to go on hemodialysis, uh, as opposed to peritoneal dialysis, that you have a fistula in place, which is a better access. All those things are quite important. The other important thing is, and it's very important, that the disease-specific therapy, uh, whether it be your, 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 your chaperone therapy or enzyme replacement therapy, the kidneys um, are, 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 are you know, they're, they're literally gone now but your other organs still have to be preserved, including your heart. So make sure that you stay on treatment for that. Uh, this is very, very important. We do that very proactively, that just because you know we are nephrologists, oh, you don't have to take any more treatment. No, you really have to preserve the other organs as well. So this is, this is quite important point to keep in mind that they stay on treatment um, even, even if, if, if they transition to dialysis and transplant. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to end my presentation. Uh, some key points, learn more about kidneys, be an active participant in your care, ask questions, let us know what you would like to hear more about. Um, I also give you some more resources. Uh, there are plenty of resources. Be careful what we resource, especially online, um, because there's, there's a lot of stuff that, that is our opinions of people, uh, not what's really accepted by, by you know, the 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 scientific community. So I think it's the, you know, the era of fake, you know, information. So be very careful about what resources and verify and verify again and, and give us uh, feedback as well. And uh, with that, um, my favorite saying is your, your eyes see what your brain knows. Knowledge is power. So once again, thank you very, very much for attending this event. And uh, I know I have about five minutes left. So if there's any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Ristovi. We have a good set of questions for you. I think we've got probably about eight. So I can kind of lump them, or if you want to read through them in the chats, what's easier for you? Uh, you know, if you can lump them, Dawn, that, sure. that, that, that would be best. Thank you. All right. There were several questions related to vitamin D. Okay. The first was, um, can you be more specific? Someone is currently taking vitamin D 50 units twice a day. What about D3? And you need to take other vitamins to make that work correctly. That's a, so maybe when say 50 units, uh, they're probably taking more than 50 units, you know, uh, 400 units or 800, 1,000, 2,000 uh, international units, if that, that's what they're talking about. Um, but but let, let me talk about vitamin D, and I'm glad that it asked. Now, vitamin D is a very important vitamin in your body, and it does a lot of things, and, and a lot of data is coming out about immune regulation, but, you know, because we tend to focus on bones, right? Bones, you know, but vitamin D does a lot more than bones, and we know that. Um, now, but, but it's a fat-soluble vitamin, so deficiency is bad, but also very high vitamin D levels are bad as well, and bad for the kidneys. Because if you go to very high levels of vitamin D, what we call hypervitaminosis D, they can lead to hypercalcemia, and then hypercalcemia or other things can shut down your kidneys as well. So, so there's a right range. So one of the questions that I get asked as a pharmacologist, what's the right dose of vitamin D, right? And the short answer is, there is no right dose. There's a right blood level. You have to go by blood levels. And the reason why that is, I'm, 
I say that is Don, what the question was very good, D2s versus D3s, right? You know, are they coming from an animal source? Are they coming from a plant source? And the short answer is the bioavailability of vitamin D is very variable, right? A lot of people will absorb. There's some patients who come to me, they are no vitamin D and their vitamin D levels are fine. And, and sun is not a good source. If, if you're using sun as a source of vitamin D, you're probably going to get, get more wrinkles and cancer than vitamin D. So do not, and if you, hopefully you're applying the sunscreen, that will block off the UV lights that are used for vitamin D. So do you see it is, so staying in sun, you know, staying in sun has other benefits, which, which, which but, but vitamin D takes supplements, but check your blood levels. That is again, the best source. And the other question that we get is, what should I shoot for? The short answer is between 30 and 50. Some people say 20 to 100. I like the, my vitamin D levels to be 30 or above, but I don't like to, them to go above 50, you know, because then we, we're going into an uncharted territory, in my opinion, that, that, that we might get complications. So between 30 and 50 uh, should be their goal. So it's not the dose that they're taking, Don, it's, it's their blood levels. And I think that's a short. Now, the other thing is, how do you increase bioavailability? Well, I'm taking 5,000 units. That's a maximum over the counter. Now, there are some prescriptions, which I think what this person might have said is 50,000 units Q week or Q month, every month they're taking that. I'm not a big fan of that, ergo calciferol, you know, versus coal calciferol. Ergo is D2, coal is D3. I'm not a big uh, fan of those 50,000 units. I tell them take one pill every day. You can take 1,000, you can take 2,000, you can take 5,000, but take it with something fatty. Because if you take an empty stomach, it's a fat soluble vitamin, right? So if you eat something fatty and you don't have to eat pure fat with that, but just something that has some fat in it, it will dissolve better. So it will increase the bioavailability. So the short answer is, is, is um, go with the blood levels. Wonderful, that's a great answer. Um, there was a question here. Uh, if everybody's GFR adjusts for aging, does that mean kidney failure is inevitable as someone gets old? Very good question. So um, with age, uh, your kidney function declines and, and, and our organ system in general declines, whether you talk about the brain, with it, right? The question that comes up is, and this is very important, is a decline like this or decline like this, right? But if it's a decline like this, they will not need dialysis. They will not need transplant, you know? Um, and the shared answer is no. You know, uh, not, you know, most of the geriatric patients are not on dialysis or, or transplant, and they shouldn't be. So that's where the nephrologist role comes in. We will find out what they, they will need, what are the indications. So the short answer is no. They, you can actually uh, live completely fine uh, with, 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 uh, with and, and we also have to look at other factors too, uh, you know, and a lot of times we offer conservative management to our patients with age. So it's a case by case, but no, the short answer is, is no, but you should preserve your kidney function as, as much as you can. Sounds good. Um, there's another person asking, do you have any data on children with Fabry disease who started treatment very young are doing with their kidneys over time? Uh, you know, there, there is some data, but Don, if you can just send me that, that email, I can share that with you, you know, um, uh, because it's, it's, it's a bit more complex answer, but, 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 but I, I will. But what I would like to say is, if you have Fabry disease, especially the classical phenotype, um, you will need to treat that um, as, as they have Fabry disease, uh, have kidney problems, because that will manifest at some point in their lifetime. Excellent. Um, how often are bone density tests recommended for Kinsey, kidney transplant patients that have Fabry? You know, um, so let me talk about the bone density a bit more, because um, you know, that's another great question. Um, now, bone density, um, the, cl the classical the, 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 the scan that we do, is not very reliable in patients with kidney disease. You really have to take, because in a kidney patient, the, the uh, bone density um, is much more complex. And, and the term that we use is osteodystrophy. You know, there's a lot more stuff going on. So my, my short answer to that would be that if, if you're transplanted with, with kidney 
this, well, obviously you have kidney disease, but, but you might still have kidney disease with a transplant, then you need to talk to your, your healthcare provider um, and especially your nephrologist, not your endocrinologist, because it depends upon your other risk factors as well. Um, you know, your ethnicity and race, your age, even your gender, right? Your prior scores. Uh, and also how do we treat that? You know, uh, because bisphosphonates, which are classically used for, for bo bone density, are especially with advanced kidney disease, we don't recommend that. You know, um, the calcium that we often give to a patient with, 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 with osteoporosis or, or even osteopenia, you know, you have to be careful with calcium. Uh, because if calcium would cure osteoporosis or osteopenia, then we would not have osteoporosis or osteopenia, if you think about that, right? So calcium and vitamin D are just one player. The osteoporosis is very complex, but now you're adding on top of that um, kidney disease. So the short answer is that if it, when you have bone density or bone, you should that should be a talking point to with 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 your um, uh, uh, nephrologist, not your endocrinologist, but talk to them. Just I spoke about that triangle, right? The heart, well, no, no, the kidney, the heart, and the bone, right? So the bone disease should be discussed with them, and depending upon all these other things, they will decide how often you should have that. But make it an active engagement with your nephrologist. Great. Um, there was a YouTube link that you showed in your presentation. Would you mind moving your slide back to that so they could, that person can take a look? Um, there was a YouTube link? Yeah, evidently. Uh, I think it was pretty early on in the slides. I'll ask you another question while you're, we're slide flipping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is from Sharon. One of my previous infusion nurses told me that by 10 years, a kidney transplant usage goes down. I'm already at 15 years. Is there a deadline for kidneys to last in the donor? Um, another great question. So let me answer that. Uh, you, you got me going on YouTube. <laughs> I know, I'm looking you for You should not have mentioned oh, Go back that one. Is that it? Maybe that's what they're looking for. Maybe you're the contact information. Yeah, so this call, so let, let me tell you, YouTube is very simple. Just put my name in, right? And and there'll be 12, 15 YouTube videos that UCLA has put together. Um, and one is on drugs and Medicaid. I mean, there are a whole bunch of them, but there's on dialysis, there's on transplant, but these are by UCLA Health. So this is um, information that we give to our patients at UCLA. And just put Anja Raskogi in, in, in the YouTube search. All of them will show up. And if not, uh, email me at corekidney at med or actually even better, email me at fabre at mednet.uc.edu and we will send you the links. Uh, Perfect, thank you that. so much. There was a couple requests for your YouTube links. Oh, um, absolutely, and those are, are very good by the way, because those are very, so let me tell you about those YouTube videos. Those are based on questions that we get asked by our patients. So it's very condensed information on those YouTube videos. Wonderful, um, with a question about anemia. Yes. Uh, what if your hematocrit but, but, is- But Dawn, uh, I'm sorry, there was another question about transplant. Can we answer yeah, that? Good. Yeah, uh, good. Uh, because that's a very important question about 15 years um, or 10 years, whatever th that was. So let me let me talk about, you know, this is an uh, important thing to keep in mind for our Fabry patients. And 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 I, I do want to spend uh, a, a couple of minutes on that. And Dawn, if that's okay, because I need to leave for my next meeting in a few mm -hmm. minutes. Um, yeah. My email information is here. Please take a snapshot of this. I'll answer all the questions. But um, Thank you. At in, in a couple of minutes, I have to leave, but but let me answer the transplant because that's also now. Um, so so when you talk about 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 um, you know the alpha gal A enzyme and and, and um, all that stuff and kidneys are our key target. Uh, they, there is plenty of enzyme alpha galactosidase A in the kidneys. So much so that initially the thought was that kidneys can provide the enzyme for the rest of your body. That, that's that, 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 that was what the thinking was. So, so when the transplant happened, people thought, well, great. So, so the kidneys have failed, we have the new kidneys and they will release this enzyme so that the entire body will get, 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 get the enzyme. Well, that didn't pan out to be true. You know, so, so we still have to be on, on whatever treatment, whether it be enzyme replacement therapy or chaperone, you still have to take that because kidneys will not, the transplanted kidneys, uh, as, as opposed to the native kidneys. The native kidneys are the kidneys that, 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 that you had originally. Now, when you have a transplant kidneys, why do the transplant kidneys fail? And that goes back to the question, right? 10 years, 15 years, I never look at that numbers. That's not the way to look at it. Um, why, but why the kidneys, 
in a good portion of patients do fail. It could be failed because of non-compliance, non-adherence. You're not taking your medications. You're not taking your, 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 your appointments seriously. Or you did something to your kidneys. You, you, you took some medication that shot your kidney. So that's one, right, why the kidneys will fail. The second reason why kidneys can fail is if the original disease comes back, right? The, the disease why the kidneys failed in the first place. And there are conditions, you know, focal segmentals and other things that the primary disease can come back in the kidneys, you know, and they fail again. And the third uh, reason would be that, that the medications, you know, even for transplant medication that you're taking, they can affect the kidneys. But the second one, if the primary disease comes back, now the primary disease does not come back in the kidneys. The reason for that is because they have the alpha-gal A enzyme. They produce enough enzyme to show. So the short answer, Don, well, I, I guess not that short. It's a pretty long answer. Uh, the long answer to that short question is that I will not go by 10, 12, 15 years. You know, I would, there are patients who have lasted for in their entire life, they, they transplant. Your focus should be being proactive. Talk to your nephrologist about how to preserve your kidney functions. Be an active participant, checking your creatine, checking your protein, all that stuff. Fabry disease should not come. Now there's some rare case reports and you know, uh, you know, very unique cases, so unique that they are actually case reports. The primary disease should not recur back in your transplanted kidney. So that's the, and, and, and the kidney should last for a very, very long time. I would not put, 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 a, put a time on that. All so right. with that, Dawn, I, I truly apologize. My next meeting is, is about to start, but I just want to thank everybody, uh, the participants. One thing nobody asked me is, what is the green ribbon? Um, so, um, and I have it on too, by the way, uh, but this green ribbon, I will send you more information about the green ribbon campaign. Uh, pink ribbon, what is pink ribbon, Dawn? Breast cancer. Green ribbon is kidney. And kidney disease does not get the, the time that it should deserve. It's a silent disease, but we don't even talk about that. So my hope after today's presentation is that kidney should be front and center, not because I'm a nephrologist, but for Fabry patients, kidneys are very, very vital. So with that, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Walter, Don, everybody else for having me a, a part of this. Um, anything that I can do, please feel free to reach out to me. You know, I'll, I'll be very, very happy. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Dr. Ristogi. That was wonderful. I know there's a couple of questions we didn't get to, but Dr. Ristogi graciously offered his email up for you to email him directly. So absolutely, I appreciate that. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Ristogi's secret code is kidney. If you'd like to go ahead and enter in the drawing, put your first name, last name, and the word kidney in the chat, and that will get you entered. <laughs>